Jupiter Broadcasting presents this show in mega stereo sound. This episode of the Linux Action Show brought to you in part by GoDaddy.com. Use the promo code Linux and save yourself some cash. And of course, from donations of people that are... It's like people get donated, you know? And it's free. It's free. It's tax. It's tax exempt. No, it's not. No. When you donate people, it is. It's tax. Right. You can't, Chris, you can't put a worth on person. This week on the Linux Action Show, we get caught in bed with another lady, and her name is Haiku. We give you a full review of this crazy great system and why it just might give Linux a run for its money. Then we react to Apple suing the Amahi project. Hint, we don't like it. Plus so much more. Ah, this week on the Linux Action Show. And welcome to season 17, episode 5 of the Linux Action Show. My name is Brian, that guy over there, the amazing one, the checkered one, the one with the perfect hair is Chris. Hey, Brian. Amazon's EC2 cloud system now runs Red Hat Linux. Yeah? Yeah. I just thought this is actually... What did it run before? Well, it actually, uh, you see, you've, oh, you've always been able to get like this Amazon brood version of Linux. Absolutely. AWS Linux. Yeah. And then now, uh, I think it was... Recently, within a year, we announced that Ubuntu was going to be available on Amazon, and that happened. That was cool, so yeah. Get, and uh, you can get OpenSUSE builds right onto and AWS. And actually, yeah, if you go to a yeah. SUSE studio, you can create your own OpenSUSE yeah. version, yeah. publish it to the gallery, and boom, one click, boom, publish yeah. it to Amazon. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and that, that happened. And, That's awesome. And, and so now Red that Hat... That seems like all you need. Right there, you should just call it a day call and not it good anything to go. else. Well, Red Hat wanted to get in the party here, Brian, so oh, now they're okay. on here, too. Instances of Red Hat start at uh, $14.05 per hour. Depending on the size of the VM deployed, of course. I mean, no, it's fourteen and a half cents per hour. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Not fourteen dollars. fourteen dollars. Thank you. Honestly, fourteen dollars an you know hour. What? I'm not. I'm not paying for nothing. No, it feels I like even it adds pay up. Fourteen dollars a month for my entire GoDaddy host. No, I know. I know. I know. Here's why. Because uh, I I transpose it just reading it there on the text, but I. I found out the hard way. See, I thought initially, and I, and I didn't look into it a lot because it wasn't on my own dime. <laughs> Just gonna disclose that. <laughs> yeah. And I found out that if you run an Amazon instance, an, an, an EC2 instance, and even if it's just like a little, this was just a little Ubuntu box. Yep. Uh, for 24 hours for a month, you still end up with the box I had, which is like their low end box. You still end up with like a $300 bill. It's just crazy doing expensive. nothing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, doing nothing. Nothing. And that's still you still pay per, on bandwidth. You pay the fifteen cents as three transfer rates and all that kind of stuff. I think it's way cool. I love Amazon EC2, but I have yet to actually use it myself for something that. Oh, uh, you know, I know I sites like to. Reddit and others have used at least the Amazon block storage components as and like a backup like thing and, or a back end yeah. like database, kind of like a block database. But uh, I would only really say you'd. I don't know. I wouldn't see a twenty four seven op using this. No, not, but honestly, it's, it's a great, Red it's a great rollover the, type system. Like your 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 website's getting crazy hammered. Yeah, roll it over to exactly. EC2. Exactly. And yeah. now, right now, if you're a Red Hat shop, which tons of sites out there yeah, are, tons of them now are. you can get in and just scale right to to your. Wabammy. Yeah. All right, B man. Now. Yes. Uh, I have uh, an Android pick that I. This is the app I have tested the longest out okay. of any app pick I've ever done on the Linux Action Show. That's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense to me. Because I really wanted to be careful on, on my recommendation of this. Now, that said, uh, first, we got to celebrate a very special day. because The we, best day of the year. We are the shooting Linux the Linux Action, Action Show. Show early this week. Apologies if you tuned in Sunday Live to catch us. We tried to give you a warning last week. Just saying. Just, just saying. saying. If you were up to date, yeah. you'd have known. You would have known. We were, you, we were recording this yeah. on a Thursday yeah. instead of a Friday, and those are different days no, of the Sunday, week. No, Sunday, man. Sunday. We, we usually do the show on Sundays. I'm just saying. I'm going to be straight with you. All right. I don't know what's going on oh, right okay. now. Okay, well, here's I what's going on. I have absolutely no I idea. I was just trying to tell the peeps that we're doing this on Thursday, which is not normal. And it's Thursday, June 23rd, 2011. Wait. 
That happens to be Danica Patrick Day. Exactly, B-Man. It's officially a real thing. Today is Danica Patrick Day. And, uh, of course, this comes from a blog from friend of the show, Mendel. He, uh, he works at Mendel. Mendel? Mendel? Actually, I've never actually talked to Mendel in real life. No. But he's friend of the show. He works at GoDaddy Fan. He watches. I'm of course. Sure saw this. Because he's uh, awesome. He posted a picture of himself rocking here with, uh, with Danica, which is really cool. And, awesome. you know, B-Man, there's no better way to celebrate Danica Patrick Day than going to our buddies over at GoDaddy.com. Where you can register websites such as danicapatrickday.info if you wanted to yeah and you could save off of dot com names if you were uh ten uh, percent was it ten percent yeah ten percent with linux off of any using the anything. code linux you just type in linux you save ten percent if you type in linux two zero you save twenty yeah. percent if what you're buying is, is hosting. linux shared hosting yeah, yeah now if you if you go to buy windows shared hosting yeah no. not gonna actually work. no it will actually work we just don't recommend anyone run Windows. We we'll just choose the Linux yeah. option. You get twenty percent. Right. I mean, off. if you it's like awesome. if you like having sex with hookers and not wearing a condom, go ahead and run Windows. I'm, dude, this is the action show. I'm putting that out there. Wow. Right. Right. So use Linux right. twenty and save save your twenty percent on Linux hosting unless you're a masochist. Right. That's all I'm saying. I, I use Linux 2.0 for all of my hosting at GoDaddy. There you go, and buddy. it's rocking. Thanks to GoDaddy for supporting the Linux Action Show, and happy Danica Kirkpatrick Day. To everyone on planet Earth, because I do believe that this is the only holiday <laughs> Chat officially room. sanctioned Chat room by I went all too far. of planet Earth. Chat room says too far. That's too far. <laughs> I'm getting a little flack from the chat room today, it, man. I'm going to be straight with you, man. All right. It was a little fun. Uh, well, I just, I, I felt it, man, from the heart. I mean, would you rather I lie or you want me to put my heart in the mic? <laughs> you felt that. All right. You know what? Yeah, no. Let's move forward. Yeah, okay. Let's move forward right. with your amazing okay. Android pick. Well, if it has anything to do with the topic that you just went too far with, no. I'm going to cut you early. I'm no. going to cut it off. Okay. At the knees. No. Uh, so Like a bouncer with a thing in his hand. This kind of is like if, you, if you've been concerned about security, on Android. And I'm not. And and that's funny that you say that. And, uh, you know, you, you're you a little concerned that maybe some of these apps that you see in the Android marketplace might not be legit. We've I know people out there have uh, have had, I've heard, I've gotten emails from, from viewers who have gotten basically scam apps installed on their phones. And uh, I've heard a lot of people out there asking me what I think of Lookout Security. And one of the other things that I wanted in um, a, a security tracking device, or something I wanted in a, in a security application is a tracking option too. Maybe not on all the time, but honestly, if I'm somewhere and I lose my phone, I do kind of like the option of being able to locate it, if I can control that, right? And Lookout does... As long as you can control it. Lookout also provides some backup options and things like that, um, and a lot of the services are for free, and my main concern was, is something like this, A, is it legit? Because, you know, it's pretty invasive with your app. It scans every app you install from the marketplace. Honestly, that makes me more nervous about than, right? than installing a and, bunch of free and apps. the other thing that I, I think initially it was kind of exposed that what they really were doing, I think this was Lookout, is early on, they really just had like a text file on their web server with like 10 Android apps in it that were known bad, because back okay. then it wasn't a big deal. And they were just checking that list and making a big production of it. But it sounds like this has actually become more of a, like a dynamic cooperation with Google to identify threats, and actually there's some active monitoring happening now. Uh, so it's becoming a little bit more legitimate, and it also can do things like when you take a photo, it can back it up to their service right away. And to their can, service. Or, I, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> I, it, it's, um, it's a cloud security-based service. Okay, okay. Now, my main concern is, is something like this going to make my phone run like crap? Because we all remember the early days and of Windows. It sucked up your battery life this, real fast. Because this a lot reminds me of early day Windows, and then putting like Norton on there and making things real slow, real Terrible. crappy, yeah. real, real crappy. Norton itself almost made Windows run slower than most of the malware yeah. that I found. It felt yeah. like that. And At least it, was, it felt like that, yeah. And so that was my concern about Lookout. Now, I can say having running it, r ran it on an Evo and on a Nexus, uh, I really haven't noticed any major impact, though... Well, that's not bad. You know, and, and you can tell on an Android device, you can look at its battery usage, you can see how much of my battery and how much of my CPU But overall, using. it seems all right that It's pretty way. good. It's reasonable for what you get, you now, know. Now, did it find a lot of problems? No, and but I'm I'm careful. I'm safe. You know, dude. I, it seems like you install like a billion apps. I though. do. I do. It but seems like if anyone was going to stumble that, that across that was kind of my thought. Apps, that was that was my thought. So I was kind of wondering if I would catch something eventually. But I still I was kind of cautious. It. So uh, at the end of the day, I think now that I'm not going to test it for the show, uh, I think it 
you know, I'm, I'm comfortable not running it. And hmm. I got to figure there's anything like this is going to add some sort of overhead to the to the overall experience. So I'm going to remove it and to see if I notice any difference too there. But overall, I can say if you are concerned, Lookout does seem to be legit. It's free. You know, and you can give it a shot. I went to a, I went to an Android developer user group meetup yeah. probably about. Oh, I don't know. I think it was back in January or December. Yeah. It was back there, and they had a guy on uh, who was... Uh uh, actually, I was speaking at that one, I think. I was talking about illumination <laughs> Illumin yep. for Android. Yep. But the other guy that spoke was talking about security stuff for Android. And he was like one of the big security investigators from some security like, investigation yeah, yeah. firm. Yeah. That's like what they did. Yeah. And he was basically saying that like things that are like virus scanners and whatnot for Android are, are just like a total joke. Like I would there's think just so. nothing like the, Because they're the like access, isolated. The access they have to each other is so limited right. Right. that it's just it's just not yeah. gonna do anything and there's just it just means absolutely it's nothing. It's still more of like the, at the time that it can kick in is at the time when the application is being installed, and it can it can and, and notice what it is, and then if it's in like a database of bad right, apps, right. it can let you know. That was kind of what people and were saying was this is the only thing that's. That's really kind of why I think it doesn't put such a load on your on your phone because it's only uh -huh. active at the time of the installation. So maybe the install takes slightly longer unless you turn on the phone locator. See then, and the other thing is nice is you have things like you can turn on alarms. Like if you just lose it somewhere in your house, you can make it beep oh, really cool. loud. I do like making things beep pretty loud. Yeah, and and you know it also back up. You know, like I said, as the backup, like the contacts See, and stuff like that. Yeah, I, so, there's, so because I think of that limitation, they're trying to add in all of that all extra, the extra value. features that make it make it kind of cool. I don't know, whatever. It's all right. It's one extra layer because it does check. It also checks side loaded installs. So you know. So that's something. Here's too. the thing. I mean, as a Linux user, I've gotten so used to never having virus scanners or anything on my systems. Like, I, like I have like a build machine that I use to build yep. Windows and OS 10 builds and everything else. I have virus scanners like ClamAV and stuff like that on there just to make sure that the builds I send out are virus free. But my home system, like, why? Like, seriously, I know. I don't. If either. you're a Linux user and you I say download stuff yeah. off Usenet or torrents no. or FTP weird no. sites and, and you start downloading stuff, if it does have a virus, what's it going to do? Run? No. no. Nope, because it's a Windows executable. I sometimes try them in Wine for and fun. You look at them like, like literally, I downloaded a torrent that was supposed to have like <laughs> a bunch of our show episodes on it. I don't know if, if you've seen this. No. But, uh, so there's a torrent out there with like, it says it has like 20 episodes of Linux Action Show. All right. So I'm like, okay, cool. I was going to grab it. I was see what say we The got. old stuff? But it was like, like a weird size. Because I know I've seen some torrents around there. It the was a stuff. weird size. Like oh. it didn't make sense to have that as the right so you, like, size. You think it's so you download it and it's a it's like a RAR file that was like password protected yeah. with a text file that says here's the password yeah so i oh, tried to open it up and it's a binary file this little text file was like supposedly have the password it was a 400k text file that was just a windows binary was i in trouble did it infect my system no because i run linux right i know man i so know it just seems silly that Android, i hey i agree psh, whatever don't I need agree that. let's talk about a linux app pick. dude lay it on us all right what i'm talking about this week is something called dark table now we've talked a lot in the past about things like f spot and shotwell and a variety of other image you know, organization tools. This one is a lot like Adobe Lightroom yeah, it in is. appearance. It's really meant for pro users or people who are photographers that really want to have a nice workflow for organizing and working with their photos from professional shoots. This is a really, really great application. It's got a lot of features. The UI is really like a darkroom UI. It's dark. It's not distracting. It's not some crazy UI. It's very, very nice. It runs on a bunch of different platforms. Well, it runs on, on Linux, and I think there's a Mac build as well, uh, but it, it runs great. And actually, here's, here's a great thing. If you go over here, if you go to darktable.sourceforge.net, uh, click on the install tab and you scroll down a little bit and it's like here's some prerequisites and down here at the bottom it's like got packages and install tips for every distro and up at the top uh here's one for microsoft windows unfortunately the community of this commercial distro didn't natively build dark table yet but there's a better solution to try for you and you can download and burden iso from this uh, ubuntu rebass uh, master and reboot your machine love it i thought that was cute uh anyway so but check it out the the features are good it does all the stuff you'd need a, a photo organizer to do exporting to yeah, that looks sweet you know picasa so that's and dark think, table one and word. a bunch of other stuff darktable.sourceforge.net and the links in the I show notes all edits are non-destructive. Um, oh, so it's good. really nice. It's really nice if you're a pro photo editor. So it's non-destructive edits. Back. Everything's very fast. It's very, very modular. Uh, currently, I believe it supports, uh, you know, export to low dynamic range, 16-bit or linear high dynamic range, file formats, TIFF. PFM, EXRs. XMP for uh, TIFFs. going to get um, 
Nice. Uh, full, gr- great support on Linux. Looks like it's got pretty good integration uh, with Supporting Gimp, which is cool. Picasso web album, Flickr uploads, disk storage, one of copies, emailing things by email. And there's, it, it'd be easy to add and, more support and one of the such things, as gallery and whatnot to it. Of course, it. one of the things I always love about uh, you know, open source is you can always see all the aspects, including the what they want features yeah. and stuff like that, which is always cool. And it's great when you're, a, and I'm serious when I say this, if you're a pro and you end up hitching your wagon, in your business to an application, the kind of see what's the kind of insight into the roadmap. Yeah. I think a lot of Final Cut users out there would really like to have been able to see Apple's roadmap, so they knew where to go in their now, in their business. One one of the extra things I I love in this is here it says uh, if available GPU acceleration via OpenCL is done. Oh, that is nice. That's pretty cool. Uh, you know, zero latency user interface through multi-level software caches. You know, full screen, zoomable user interface. I mean, just really, really nice features of this. Honestly, it's got Pro Tools here. I mean, it's got uh, it's, it's got for Pro users. It can now. it can read the camera metadata files. So you can pull the data out of that. It's got built-in color profiles. So you can round trip to uh, f- uh, more advanced photo editors and editors. support for translations in Albanian, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, if you would like this software. Or to be in Albanian, you can do it. That is cool. Uh, That's a pretty good app. I like that. <laughs> it, it's a great app. Honestly, this hasn't pulled me away completely from F Spot in part because I'm so tied yeah. into F Spot. I'm so well, invested and, and the into tagging is, is, and everything else in F Spot. Uh, you, you know, do you do you maybe use F Spot for your more casual stuff? And then when you're out there really trying well, to for me, there's no real difference for me. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. Like right. like I'm not a pro photographer. I just have a kind of nice camera and I take a lot of pictures. Yeah, okay. You know, it's mostly just me hanging out stuff. But honestly, yeah. I love the UI of this. It's crazy fast. And you got it the option to all step the features it up. I need. Yeah, yeah. So that's what's cool. You could go I, from F Spot to this. I would love an f-spot import so i could bring in all my tags mm. from f-spot into dark table then i would do it in a heartbeat but if not uh, if i was just starting from scratch i'd, I'd think about dark table yeah because yeah if you're starting from scratch i could see if you've got a more established library that could be a bit more of a challenge but this is a great if you're have you have friends on windows or mac and they're using like adobe lightroom and oh, they yeah. need a professional mm. photo management tool point them to dark table because yeah. this is the tool this is the alternative to lightroom really is what it is there you go all right, B-Man. That's it. That's all I've got to say on that matter. I like that pick. I do, too. What do you think? That's you know why what? I picked it. You know what it feels like? You know what it feels like? No. It feels no, like... No. Hey, Brian. I don't know what it feels... You know what? Wait. wait. Let's do the what news. Do all right. What's new in the news this week? All right, Brian. The top story on the news docket for this week. Apparently, Apple are big fans of the Linux Action Show. Apparently. They friggin' watch the Linux Action Show religiously. Not only that, but they must watch it, like, immediately. Because last week, we reviewed Amahi. And as you may remember, Amahi is freaking awesome. It's this open-source project with a little bit of a startup behind it. They're trying to build this great server platform that makes it really easy to to configure and and build a small business or home server. It fits in so great with that whole build-your-own-cloud that we've been talking about. And it's like, here it is. It's like, build-your-own-cloud in a box, and you add components like a wiki or or email via an app store and it works fantastically and it is an app store and we specifically you know we when, when it's funny is when we brought this up in the review last week i never even associated the app store name with apple no because and, and here's the thing everyone knows apple's going after people by now you've probably heard apple's going after a mahi because it's everywhere because everyone's pissed off about it you've heard about apple going after amazon for using the phrase app store yeah now the stupid thing is this it's a store it's a store for apps people have called applications apps for decades now i know i called apps apps when i was in junior freaking high school i know it has nothing to do with with apple in fact i I it's a marketing thing it's a marketing thing but it's a it's a mean marketing thing it's like it's like apple's trying to make sure the entire universe knows that they're Jurgoff. Well, here's what Amahi's doing. Because they're not, I mean, come on. Apple can have as many app stores as they want. They don't have an app store. They don't have something called app store. They have something called the iTunes app store. Yeah, yeah. 
Mm, and a mahi. Yeah. yeah and they have you, the Mac App Store. And they have the Mac App Store. Right. And a Amazon has the Amazon App Store. Right. And this is the Amahi App Store. It's a specific thing. So, so the fact that they're going after Amahi. Amahi right. obviously doesn't have the resources to take a company no. like Google on. So th I think what they're doing is they're taking it in stride. And I'm actually pretty I'm pretty impressed by this. Yeah, they're I'm throwing a name the store contest. I'm proud of them. They're and they're and it's, so, so we'll we'll put a link in the show notes, but they've outlined a way that uh, fans out there can uh, get a hold of them and maybe suggest and, and from the sound of things, they've name. gotten a metric ton of suggestions so far. Good. Uh, they've gotten yeah, look at the ev everything from, you know, like legitimate, like here's a cool thing to call it, to here's what you could name it that might piss Apple off but technically be okay. 157, 157 comments on their blog post alone. Yeah. Yeah. How about Apple sucks store? I mean, <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's great. I love how they're handling this. They're going to rename it. They're just like, you know what? We can't fight this. We're going to rename it. We don't know what to name it. Yeah. And they're getting so much attention for it and it's deserved attention so really all that apple has accomplished here is they've made themselves look bad they've given a bunch of people the opportunity to see what a mahi is that's, that they never could before and is, that's awesome it is you know that is the positive aspect of this is it probably is good exposure for the amahi project yeah. and i think in that regard wow that could maybe apple did it on purpose because they're nice guys no no but maybe i hope maybe apple was watching the show like steve steve sits around on the weekends yeah. and he watches the Linux action. Sure. He's like, he's like Sunday night. I mean, we, six o'clock. Gonna watch the Linux you know, action it's 10 show. 10 a.m. He's on the he's on the Pacific. He's on he's on the same time zone. As oh, I. so he watches it live? Of course, he's Steve Jobs. Well, I man. didn't know he watched it live, but that makes total Dude, sense. Dude, if you're Steve Jobs and we're streaming it, although you we watch do, it. Drop. Well, we do stream in Flash. Unless you're watching. Well, he has. He probably has an iPad. And he there's has an, an iPad. iPad. There's, there's an, an iPad. There's an app. iPhone an app. app. Yeah, yeah, you can get for that. Yeah, so he's probably sitting there watching it. He's freaking out. He's like, Amahi, that's a great service. This is so much more interesting than anything we at Apple are doing. Here, I'm gonna go ahead and give them some free press. Mm -hmm. That's obviously what he thought. Thank you, Steve Jobs, for doing that. And thanks for continuing to be a supporter of the Linux Action Show. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, as uh, Threeville uh, points out in the chat room, is Steve Jobs is uh, so impressive. He probably watches last two hours before we even stream it live. Probably. That's pretty exclusive. I mean, he seems real cool that way. Yeah. 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 He seems like a great guy. Right, like let's that. move on to something more Let's talk about This is actually pretty cool. Uh, this is, wow. I mean, like, boom, hit me in the face like, uh, hey there, this is a phone and you're going to look at it. Right. What do you think of this, B-Man? Nokia introduces the Nokia N9. <laughs> oh, boy, Brian. It runs Mego. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not actually physically shipping yet. But I got to say, this is one slick looking system it runs kind it of is. a ui uh, overlay called swipe it's got a unibody design with a 3.9 inch curved glass amoled screen which means it's just gonna pop like a son of a gun no buttons though which is kind of weird but it's got a carl zeiss dual led flash powerful camera this th this sucker i believe has an 8 megapixel bad man a in hell of a camera this is really looking like uh, uh, a rocking device. It also has NFC, which, uh, take it or leave it, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I don't care about that. going to come in several colors. It's I'm going to disable that as soon as I get it, as soon as I play with one. It's looking pretty sharp. i got to say, um, it, this unibody design they have here makes it look like it's going to be a real nice fit in the hand. Um, it does. It does look nice. I have a couple of concerns about this phone. Oh, okay. Uh, so I thought it, you'd be all about this. It looks great. Honestly, the battery life looks awesome. I like that there's a Mego phone coming out. I really, really like that there's a Mego phone coming yeah, out. Yeah, I would think so, right? A couple of concerns about this. The first off is I am a big Mamo guy. Like yeah. I liked the N800, the N810, our, uh, the N900. Uh, to I be love frank, our various our various uh, trips into Mego land for this show kind of left a bad impression. They left a bad impression. Um, that said, it's not bad technology. It's not like it's a bad piece of software. Um, so, but so I'm I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know. This reminds me, okay, so take the N900 that already exists. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring mine today. Uh, but it has a nice slide-out physical keyboard. Yes. Really, the N900 was like a portable computer in your in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And that was how they build it. And for a guy like me, that was perfect. That was what I wanted, uh, you know? This I is had a, phone. a full open debian based linux distribution in my damn pocket and it was so cool now this is a whole different deal well what if you just use this as your phone like this is your main phone you don't have to get rid of your n900 cuz i know you're not always happy with the n900 as a phone but there's so, no there's no keyboard well i mean you just well, you still have the you still it's have the n900 screen keyboard but there's no there's no physical keyboard i don't know like i i look yeah. at this and i'm like ah i'm i'm, I'm interested but i'm not crazy interested I, I really don't know i don't know that i necessarily want one and that's the weird thing is i'm looking at this and yeah. i'm thinking you know 
I don't know that I want one. And it got me thinking, what is it that I actually want? What is it that, I mean, if the N9 is not exciting me, it has a beautiful screen. It has a great battery life, supposedly. Looks like it's a pretty good build, It's running too. Mego, which really is a fairly powerful system, and it's Linux-based, and I love that. Yeah. I love that. It kind of seems like this Why? should be giving you nerd wood. It should, but it's not. I'm and it may be, maybe it's that I've been so disillusioned about Mego over the last year and a half or so that I'm just I'm just not interested in something that says Mego anymore. Well, maybe that's I'll what tell it you is. what it is for me because I'm actually in the same boat as you, B man. Yeah. And this is what's this is what's got me uh, feeling like we're getting a little uh, we're getting rained on, but I don't think it's water, B man. So uh, <laughs> St- Stephen Elop here. Um, I I honestly now. I want to I want to frame this. I okay, Stephen fr- Stephen Elop is is the CEO of yes. Nokia. Yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, which before you begin this, okay. I would like to make okay. sure it's it's clear. We were talking about this before the show. A little on the on the and live I, stream. I, I don't think I don't think people realize this, but Stephen Elop, his last name is E L O P. Elop. Backwards that spells poll. Now continue. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> Which I did not know. If you're watching live, you got to see me kind of lose it at that. But now that I have regained myself, you're I will welcome. continue. I want to frame this in such that I want the people out there to understand that I have actively been trying to not prejudge Stephen Elop because I know he came into a real bad situation. He really did. He and, inherited Nokia in a funky state. And he, you know, even though he came from Microsoft, which set off a few alarms, I said, ah, but there's some great people at yep, Microsoft. Yep, yep, great sure, people that sure. have come from there and given a lot to the and, open and source world. He's not so there anymore. No he got out of there, right? He left. He jettisoned. I came from Microsoft. So I well, was a Microsoft guy. That was years ago, B-Man. That was years ago. But see, I changed. I, I left Microsoft. Not a mic. This is, I know, I do Linux Action Show. Right. Big difference. So, so exactly. not a knock against them. So you see, that's what I figured. That was kind of my thinking. Is like, okay, any Anybody can get into anything, and so I thought I'm going to give old Elop here a, ch- a chance. Yeah, but I'll tell you, BusinessWeek.com and link in the show notes did a great write-up, a six or seven page write-up here uh, on a trip over to uh, Nokia when when they they were there when Elop announced to the te- to the team about canceling Migo essentially. Yep. and you know uh, uh, around page six in this article, um, Elop starts to go into his thoughts on Migo. And yeah. these thoughts kind of frame it in a way where everything's past tense. Migo was. Migo was going to be. Right. And um, then, then later, uh, there is a, a video that was quote-unquote leaked online. I don't know if I have a, sh- a link to that in the... Uh, I don't think I do. But uh, it came out today. Uh, Nokia, there's this leaked video where Nokia is essentially showing off what is the same hardware as this N900. Not quite... I, um, but really close. Caveat, you know, it looks like a different camera, likely uh, due to the requirements of Windows Phone 7. It's also a different processor. Um, but running Mango, which is a version of Windows Phone 7. Right. And it, it really looks like this, and, and, and if you read this Business Week article, Elop uh, alludes to this, and this N9 was already in the production pipe. Right. And so they said, well, we're, we want to ship something we can sell. We, we committed to another phone this year. Take this and let's use this phone to do lessons learned that we're going to apply to the one we build for Windows Phone 7. And so that's exactly what this is a prototype for Windows Phone 7. If they would have had the Windows Phone 7 software available when they built this, it would probably be, I would think, running that. Um, and so this is not something to get excited about yet, in my opinion. Maybe maybe this thing will do really well and Nokia will change its tune. And, and there is probably, you can always vote with your wallet, but I believe at this point you're taking a risk. You're not buying into a system. Now, if you're okay with that, which honestly I think I could get behind, I don't need a phone to be an ecosystem. I don't need a phone to be this. You just need it to have, be to be cool and do what you want. Yeah, you know, if I could do a few basic smart apps and I can make good calls and it's a nice rugged phone with good battery life and based on the processor specs and based on the battery information that's out there about this phone, it actually should get what some people are saying is insanely good battery. Which I'm looking forward to. That would be great. Um, and it's got, you know, it looks like it's got great build construction. I'm a fan of Nokia phones from the past. I, I could still see this some being viable. Great phones. Especially cameras. Uh, the cameras on some of their phones are just knockout But I awesome. feel like they're memo and it all over again with this thing. So when the N900 shipped, which is an amazing phone, still is, I love mine. Yeah. Uh, it was essentially a dead operating system from the day it shipped. Yeah. There were some uh, uh, OS updates. 
but very few. Yeah. Inconsequential for the most part, yeah. other than some, you know, some some like uh, general firmware issues that you know for connecting to different uh, carriers and that sort of thing. But really, that's about it. The, but it's what's, dead in the water, basically. Even though it was dead, Lame duck. the amount of amazing software that came out for it Shit, that was ported from previous Mamo incarnations well, community. and and uh, other Linux distributions and other Linux applications is just astounding. Yeah. So. Let's look at it like this. The N9 is coming. Okay. It's running Mego. Okay. It's going to get a large collection of Linuxy software. I hope. For sure. It, it runs Qt, uh, so yep. porting a lot of Qt yep. applications, so it's going to be no brainer. Yeah, I hope so. Porting Mamo applications is going to be a little more difficult, but doable. So we're going to see a lot of those. I'm sure you're going to see a lot of things like Scum VM and a lot yeah, of applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the other thing. It's also got the potential for running Alien Dalvik. You're kind of which, selling me on this. Why are you not on board no, with hold this? No, hold on, hold on. So, so you, so Alien Dalvik is going to allow people. To to run unmodified Android applications on the same right, device. Right. Now, theoretically, it could also allow people that means to install things like the Amazon App Store and run the Amazon App Store in Alien Dalvik mm -hmm. to download and install additional that, Android that's applications. That's totally legit. In fact, Rim is going that route uh, yes. on the playbook, which is very cool. So, from a software ecosystem standpoint, even if the N9 ships and is dead, even if it, it lands in your hand and that very second, Stephen Elop gets on stage and said, "I just murdered everyone who has ever worked." Worked on on Mego, right? And you will never see another software update. <laughs> you screw all Man, you that guys. guy's a dick. His, his name's backwards, Paul. So even if that happens, you still have probably one of the largest software ecosystems available for right. applications because if you, you have all of Android. You probably have most of what's coming from Mamo. Yeah. You have a huge set side of things from the KDE and QT side of things. The, the odds of seeing a lot of the KDE-based applications is very high. And this is a pretty good device. I could see people being willing to, uh, you know, go for this. And really work with it. The problem is I bet it's going gonna, it's gonna to be unsubsidized. But all of these things added up, this actually sounds like a pretty good direction to go. So where's your hesitation? My my hesitation is that I don't know what the state of Migo is going to be when the phone lands, and uh -huh. I know that already this phone is not just Migo but a modified Migo. So what is going to happen with it? How yeah, much you're right, access you're right. am I going to have by default? Am I going to need to essentially do the equivalent of of you know root the device? You think because it's and so unique they would I, they would understand I that. Do that? Am I going to have issues running say application stores through Alien Dalvik? What are the potential yeah. issues there? That all has to be answered. I need a lot of things answered yeah. before I'm going to really be able yeah. to jump on. Board. Well, I guess that's true. You got to get Plus, those things figured out. Where's my physical keyboard? There's probably not going to be a subsidy. Know, but. Um, but you know, there's uh, probably what you'll get is, but you'll get applications where there are some already for the Android where you can use an actual keyboard. And then those circumstances where you want a keyboard, you could use one, but otherwise use your N900 for that or something like that. Right. I just think, you know, going this route, if that happens, if that plays out, and I could really see that happening, uh, this could be a great phone for people like us that are into this kind of technology That's but still want a good I'm phone. Thinking. I agree, though, that the, my main concern is. Is, is kind of echoing what you said, is I'm worried about the long-term viability of the Mego OS on that device. Right? you got to figure, if, it, if that device does really good, the Mego community will probably do, you know, new spins for that hardware. But if it just does so-so, we're kind of dependent on Nokia for future OS updates. Super, super dependent. Yeah. Yeah. It's risk. So that's got to, it's, it's kind of, it's a chicken and the egg because you almost would need the volume there to make the community step up, but the community's not going to step up until the volume's there. Right. So we'll have to see what happens, B-Man. Of course, we'll follow it here on the Linux Action Show. Yeah, we'll follow it pretty closely. I'm hoping we'll get our hands and be able to play with it. Yeah. Really see how it goes. But honestly, I'm just sticking to my N900 for now because my N900 well, is everything I works. want. I can run things like yeah. DOSBox and run old DOS applications no problem and believe me I do I have like all the old King's Quest games loaded up on that and they play fantastically I've got Space Quest on there <laughs> it's awesome oh, and that's man. all on my N900 phone with a keyboard with arrow keys so yes, I can play those is, old games the D-pad thing is nice you cannot do or, that yeah with I guess this. they're arrow keys aren't they they're not D-pad yeah, the arrow anymore. keys but you yeah. can't do that on, on, on a thing that only has a touch screen well unless that it does like a Bluetooth problem. keyboard or something right but then you've got a big know, old jerking thing and, all right let's talk anyway, about uh, talk about another thing let's talk about Sabion Sabion on Linux. Boy, it's been a long time since we've had to butcher the pronunciation of that. Very long time. Uh, but we reviewed this a while ago on Linux Action Show. If you're not familiar, think uh, what you think what Ubuntu is to Debian, Sabayayayayayayan uh, is to Gentoo. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's so basically a good way to look at it. It's uh, it's a nice, real, prettied up, pre-packaged. So you don't have to sit there and build your whole system from scratch. It walks you through installs. And the great thing about it is it's always rocking. Though interesting, they went the GNOME two route. Yeah. But look how shamexy this GNOME two is, man. <laughs> they did a great. That's job. a great.
great looking desktop. Really and then here's their KDE job. too, which is yeah. also really great looking. Uh, and and because it's Gen 2 based, you know, you generally I think people tend to agree the performance is a little step above most. Stellar. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's the last version we reviewed was just rocking. I think something else you're going to see a lot of distros start doing, and let's just I think as far as I know, this is one of the bigger ones that did yeah. it first. Could be wrong, but they're shipping Chromium by default. I don't think a lot of the other big guys or semi big, big guys, guys are doing yet. that. They've talked about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know Shuttleworth has talked about yep. running Chromium as yep. the default uh, browser, but they didn't in the last release. Uh, so there are uh, other things that are nice for those of you who've tried it before and were a little disappointed in the installer's capability to support RAID or LVM. That's been added now, too. Nice. So a nice release, and Very of course, nice. uh, they've got... Um, uh, this is interesting, too. They've added something called the uh, kernel switcher, which is, and I don't know if this is something that is unique to them or if this is something I'm just not familiar with, that lets you switch between Sabi and kernels. And one of the reasons you might so do that cool. is you can subscribe to, in, like, in the Gen 2 Portage uh, tree, you can subscribe to different takes of the Linux kernel, like, yeah. you, you know, different people's different patches and optimized yeah. patches and yeah. stuff. And so yeah. this would be a fun way to switch between like them. Like, you can try it out. Whoa, that crap did not work. Yeah. Revert. <laughs> exactly. Boom. Yeah. yeah I, mean, it's, I mean, of course, you can already kind of do that by installing a bunch of kernels and then maybe using grub or yeah, something. Yeah, and I like a different this. Kernel. But this is literally this is just like undo. Switch. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, go this one, try yeah. that one. No, this one. That's uh, better. Let's, That's so cool. Let's talk about uh, a little follow-up here, B-Man. So, uh, weeks ago, we talked about uh, Oracle and Android thrown down. Boy, a year ago almost? Long time ago. Been a long time. Yeah. And so you, you guys you guys are probably familiar. Oracle is suing Google. Because uh, because they want to. Uh, for the jo for use of Java and Android in Dalvik right. and because copyright violations. Oracle potential. acquired Sun. Sun is Java and has all the Java patents. Yeah. And so now they're taking all yeah. those patents that they got from acquiring Sun and going after everyone that's using Java. Yeah, and Java. my personal speculation is, is when Sun was trying to get sold, they probably hung that out there as a possible oh, carrot. Oh, sure. And, of course, everyone knows that Oracle's top boy, uh, Larry Ellison, is best friends with Steve Jobs. And, of course, Steve Jobs probably hates Google these days, so it's a great little situation for everybody. Whoa. And uh, one of the other things that's kind of interesting now, and now this comes from uh, our buddy, our friend, Mr. Ott Fass, uh, uh, Foss Patents, the guy that uh, has always not gotten credited, and sometimes people get mad when we cite him, but I'm going to cover this because I don't really see anybody else talking about this, and he's linking to the actual court filings. So he's, it's not just random made-up stuff. Right. He uh, may, his, his conclusions may be wrong, but the details are from those. Yeah, here's the details. Uh, uh, Oracle's going for billions of dollars from Google. In fact, uh, according, to the, according to the docs that they filed, uh, they're going for uh, damages. Their damage claims are in the range between 1.4 and 6 Point one billion dollars. I guess technically that's not billions. That's just billion and change. Still though, a lot of cash. Six billions of them. Six? Oh six. Six? Oh six point one. Oh yeah. sorry, one point four and six point that Between, is billions. Yeah. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. Uh so <sighs> And uh, Oracle, the way Oracle's been positioning themselves, it sounds like they're ultra confident, but of course that's what Oracle thinks. Google maintains God. that this is not going to go anywhere. My God, man. Yeah. Could you imagine what you could do if you took, let's say, $6.1 billion away from, away from Google and Android development, and you put it in a startup that's whole job was to make the most kick-ass mobile yeah. Linux-based Linux distro ever? Can you imagine what $6 billion would do? It would be amazing. A couple million would be pretty rocking. <laughs> yeah. $6 billion would be insane. I want to talk about something uh, regarding GNOME 3. Let's give a little love over to GNOME right, 3. Because, you know, love. there's been some hate. There's been some mutual love. $6 billion, I know. dude. I know. Imagine if the GNOME project got I six billion dollars. Think about that many billion dollars. It's too many billions, Brian. Like it, when you think about billions of dollars, you think Scrooge McDuck. Am I right? I think about swimming in that big you money thing. You yeah. swim in his vault yep, yep. full of coins, and yeah. you think maybe he's got a billion. Maybe because I mean, come on, that vault vault was huge. But coins kind of exaggerate. They, yeah, they make it look bigger. But than sometimes it is. there's cash in there too. I think there's no way he had six billion dollars. No, and he was Scrooge McDuck. Probably two billion best. Two billion at best. Yeah. So think about that for a second. That's not even the full worth of these companies. That's just like Oracle, like, eh, well, I don't know, how's $6 billion sound Probably here, pretty good. Oh, well, $6 billion, can you wait until Tuesday when the check claims? Like, no, yeah. dude, seriously, yeah. insane. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's talk about GNOME 3. Let's talk about GNOME 3, Brian. It's been time. There's a yeah. cool project underway, and uh, I'll, I'll give you the details that I have here, But uh, and, and then there's a video in the show notes you might want to go check out to see it in action if you're curious. Anyways, it's called Sweet Tooth. And the Sweet Tooth project aims to make adding extensions to GNOME uh, as nice. simple as a one-click install on a web page. Nice. Very nice. Because uh, if you're watching the video now, he essentially clicks something that says remove this icon or add this menu feature. He clicks on it right there. I guess... 
I guess it's technically a JavaScript modification. Yeah, it's in some just cases. modifying JavaScript because the the whole GNOME three shell is so predominantly JavaScript yeah. that it's really easy to modify on the fly, and that's really cool. Yeah. Now I may not I'm not a huge fan of the default layout of GNOME three, right? But it's so customizable. Well, when you tweak it a bit, it gets better and better. It gets and better and like better. Like you add like you have a you have your like a regular main menu. I went again to, I went to a very and it's not even the normal main menu, no. but it's it's something I kind of yeah. like and yeah. and I I just love it. But this is really cool. Sweet it's, tooth is neat. Sweet tooth, and again, link with a video in the show notes, and it's super neat. I'm I'm really curious to see where it goes, and I'll give it a try after the show. I didn't get a chance to try it. I would love for it to be like a big, massive repo of all the cool ways you can tweak your oh, system. Because I, I with, think so. If you think about it, with Gnome three, you just like try it. No, I don't like it. Turn Undo, it off. Undo. Yeah. Next one. No, to go back to that. And one. then this awesome. is this kind of stuff is going to get people all hot to trot to try out Gnome three. So it's this is totally good for the Gnome is. three project. Too. Way cool. Even uh, even if I wouldn't be surprised if we have a few people from the Gnome project getting a little ruffled that the experience is getting changed or it's screwing with stuff. And yeah, whatever. It's going to be good for the Gnome project in the long run. And a lot of these uh, good... They can cope. And maybe there'll be some sort of metrics and they'll be able to tell which ones are the most popular and then the Gnome project and can plus, look at that and implement think, those things. I don't think the Gnome 3 guys are going to have a hard time with it. You don't purposefully build a shell-like know, that's experience that's in true. JavaScript that's without true. knowing Well, you remember, it's be you remember like, like in the like early days up, of... By up the butt. You know, those early days of like those... Up the butt customization. <laughs> Up, oh, that up them. Okay, anyways, those early days. <laughs> That's the noise it makes. I would assume. I'm a guessing. So. Yeah. I don't know. No. Yeah. Uh, so the early days of Ubuntu, you can you can still find them today, but people really were all uh, at, from Canonical were really negative on these Ubuntu tweak tools that you could <laughs> yeah. download. But now they've kind of supported it. Well, yeah, yeah. It's all it's changed now. You can find them easily now. But back then they were really kind of they butt hurt about it. it. Yeah. And so I'm I'm wondering if the same thing <laughs> happens for them. Butt centric comments this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know it's funny. I actually got uh, several comments uh, uh, from uh, uh, Are you searching for the email right now? Hold on, hold on. I, I love it. I gotta I gotta see if I can find this here. Oh yeah, I love all it. Alright, alright, yeah. alright. Um, I, got, I got many emails over the last, oh I don't know, so many so many years where people talk about their kids watching the Linux Action yes, Show yes, with them. Yes. And I immediately am thrilled. I'm like, that's great. And then I think, oh, I've, you say said, stuff, like, I've said some not yeah, safe for kids things. Yeah, yeah. Alright, uh, and this guy quotes, I won't, I won't say his name, but he's Rob. Let's just call him Rob, we won't yeah. say anything else oh, about him. put his handle. You should have given out his, don't, don't give out his no, handle now. I won't say anything else, yeah, but yeah. it's just Rob. Anyway, okay. Thanks again for an informative and entertaining show. My six-year-old runs into the room each time he hears the show start on my computer, and he always asks, when are they going to show Danica Patrick and talk about GoDaddy? He always stays until that point, after which he leaves to go play with his Kubuntu install on his own computer. He learned yes. to dual boot at age four. Hopefully we have a future geek in our hands. It's, it's all great stuff. A um, future geek? How about a current um, geek? But, uh, one... I love that he's a six-year-old's like, sweet Linux action show. Oh, Danica Patrick's coming on. I love that. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's just a lot of fun. Yeah. But then I'm thinking, I don't know if a six-year-old should be really be hearing about the butt hurtness and that the, that yeah. is the sound of up the butt and yeah. all these other things that I didn't even know before starting the episode today. Yeah. Uh, it's all new to me. Uh, so I'm thinking it's probably good that this young man... I bails like after the GoDaddy ad. Well, it does go down a hell, downhill from there, right? It really Actually, does. our next segment, we should jump to it. I I hope I don't get any hate mail over this next segment because I have a feeling I'm about to ruffle a few feathers, B-Man. So are you ready? You ready to go? Dude, I'm ready. All right, B-Man. That's all the news for this week. There was a period of time when the Linux Action Show was not the Linux Action Show. I wondered show. if you were going to go here. The, awesome. There was a small period of time where we're like, you know, there are so many cool projects in this yeah. world that we want to talk about. Yeah. So we suspended the Linux Action Show and we created a new show called the Computer Action Show. It was essentially a combination between what we're doing now yep. and like the Computer Chronicles in the old days. Yep. And... It was a mistake. It, it was, was a boo-boo. And we, we immediately went back to doing the Linux Action Show. That's but how we do. one of the cool things about it was we got a chance to review projects that, that weren't necessarily Linux. Yeah. And one of the things that we reviewed was Haiku Release 1 Alpha 2. Yeah. It is an operating system that is, if you are not aware, and for those of you who are, bear with me. I want to get this out so you guys know what we're talking about here. It is a complete open source re-implementation of the B operating system. Now, it's not part of the B operating system. No. They literally rewrote from scratch the whole damn and thing. If you use it, you almost find this fact unbelievable because it unbelievable. seems unbelievable. It seems first of all, it does not seem like an operating system, the state an operating system should be for something that is new code. And then second of all, it is so 
a, uh, a familiar to the old B operating system that it almost just seems like it must be a line for line move. They went ahead and they decided they wanted to make as much effort as possible to make it both binary and source code compatible with the old B operating system. It's so which, brilliant. Which was a big deal in the 90s. It never really got a huge amount of market share. I, I was a registered BIOS developer back in the day, so I have a little bit of a bias going yeah. on. I think it's a great system. Yeah, I didn't it's, really jump in until BIOS 4 and then 5 and then of course and it, then it died. died. And then it died. Yeah. Uh, it, it went the way of the dodo. In fact, it was acquired by Palm Incorporated and we thought, you know what, yeah. for a while yeah. the B operating right. system was going to live on so, as maybe the next yep. mobile version of Palm OS. That S didn't happen, That Brian. didn't happen. It got sold off. Those, those pieces and parts got sold off to a Japanese firm and it's over there in debt. However, and then Palm Wah. got bought up by, by HP and the rest is history and we have WebOS. Bob's your uncle. So, the people who got together and originally created, I think it was called OpenBIOS originally, and they renamed themselves to Haiku. Hey. And Haiku is what they're called now. And it's called Haiku because BIOS has this wonderful thing or had this wonderful thing where error messages tended to be written in Haiku form. Oh, I and see. And in fact, if you search for BIOS Haiku error messages, you'll find a huge list of them, uh, particularly with their web browser. The web browser would create things like, like website not found. You know, leaves blow in the wind, like kind of, kind of little, little mini <laughs> poems. It's just beautiful. That's adorable. So it's an operating system. Now, here's a couple of things about the operating system that might interest you. It is fully open source. That's very, very cool. It has its own C++ based API for building applications. It's very, very object oriented and very, very multi-threaded. In fact, the the Haiku and, and BIOS folks call it pervasive multi-threading. Pervasive. Basically, basically meaning. Everything is a freaking threat. So everything is just heavily multi-threaded. And I like Chris, that. could you bring up uh, the th the uh, the little uh, the little thread thing here? Is that this guy? Am I looking at that? Oh yeah, there that you guy go. right there. Yeah. All right. So built into Haiku uh, is the ability to look at all your applications, Jesus. see how much processor usage they're doing, and drill down. Like let's uh, select the activity. Mo uh, uh, go down to desk bar. You see desk, desk bar, bar down yep, there. Desk bar is a nice little application. All right. So there's all the threads in desk bar and you can set the th priority in real time on all of the threads running inside of every application. So if you have a web browser, for instance, this can be everything from uh, each individual render view of the web browser to the JavaScript engine to um, the, the sockets, individual sockets, wow. and threads. And this you can say huh? this is taking up too much processing time, lower its priority, and vice versa. Yeah, very, look very at cool. this is just really fundamental, isn't it? it? It's an amazing thing. And the amazing thing about it is it's not hard to use. It's not nerdy no. features. In fact, it's presented in a way... It almost throws you. Like, here, I'll show you. Check this out. So, it's... This is the file system. Now, you're, you're one level abstracted from it in the uh, GUI, right? There is, there is actually one level below this. But when you're inside the Haiku directory, it's, it's, almost, it's almost Mac OS 9 in classic style where you have... Kind of. You have apps, you have your home folder, and your system. Like, and if you go into system... Oh, don't rename system. If you go into system, you see things like the kernel and the system files and... And it's easy to swap pieces and parts out. I mean, it's just like, it's all right there and it, it, it just makes sense and it's so simple. And everything in Haiku is very modular. If you, if you think back to like the old Mac OS days where everything was like extensions and things like that, the same thing is true on Haiku. Everything is kits. So you have like an audio kit and a media kit mm. and all these different kits that get loaded up when the, when the system starts and those handle individual pieces and parts. And it's fantastic. You can swap those kits it's out. Super modular. Yeah, and the, the whole system is POSIX compliant, which means uh, if bringing over uh, and porting Linux software is relatively easy. Case in point, uh, uh, y you can get KOffice running yeah. on Haiku right now. Uh, in fact, you can get uh, you know, all of KDE is ported over. You can load up KOffice. And if you go to a website called HaikuWare.com, uh, which is basically the, the kind of website for grabbing Haiku-related software, you can go in there, check out the productivity. There's not a whole lot of software, but there are Office suites such as KOffice. And here, let me just bring up a screenshot here so you can see it. Yeah, and you know, while that lo oh, there you go. I was going to say, while that loads, look at me over here. I've got, uh, there's K-Office on Haiku. This is K-Office on Haiku, and it is uh, really quite phenomenal. And it has mostly, mostly, not entirely, but mostly a native look and feel yeah. on Haiku. Now, over here, of course, you still got the power. So you can, you know, here's a terminal, and it's, it's kind of got the commands that you're familiar with. 
things like that. So, you know, it's like not too, it's not, a lot of your Linux commands that you know and love are still here. Right. Grep, you know, is top in here even? Yeah, like even top's in here. Uh, or something, starting infinite intervals. <laughs> there, <laughs> there we go. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I want to note, now this, the one we have in order to be able to show you visuals is in an, is in a uh, emulator in VirtualBox. Haiku is stupid fast. I don't know how well this will show up. But stupid fast. Let's let's just see if this works. I don't know with this capture and everything if this is going to freak out or what, but uh, I'm going to reboot this machine. And I want to show you guys, and I know we <laughs> always give everybody a hard time when they talk about boot speed, but just just watch this here when this starts up. All right, so here's Haiku. It's booting, it's booting right, right now. now. All right, it's booting. And, and three, two, uh, done. So about five seconds. You know total. what? Screw 18-second boot speed. This is in a freaking virtual box emulator, and it boots crazy amounts yep. faster yep. than Almost any distro I've ever seen in my life, uh, unless you're just booting straight into a Super shell. Super lightweight, great, a great uh, system, uh, really easy to use. You'll wrap your brain around it immediately. In fact, the only hang-up you might have is on, on sometimes making things harder than they actually are. The downside is, is the application... St still not a lot of strong apps for it. Not a lot of strong apps. So that is the big the big problem. Now, we're running Haiku Release 1 Alpha 3, which just came out this last week. I do recommend you try it and check it out. However, if yeah. you go to haikuware.com right now, you're going to have a hard time running all of the software. So a lot of it will run and will run great. Some of it simply won't. Case in point... K Office. Yeah, now, uh, not so great. If you try and run K Office out of the box, there are some issues. Why? Because it's alpha software. In fact, the third alpha, and they are continually modifying the libraries, adding and removing things. They're tweaking it and getting ready for the final stable release one version. Uh, but during that process, you're going to see a lot of breakages between versions. So if you if oh, you want to okay. run really, uh, the alpha two, all the software is going to run great. I expect you wait a few weeks. Most of the software, including K Office, will work great out of the box. I was able to get K Office. Gotcha. up and running and if you read the comments on Haikuware you can get it up and running so too. So it's just but a it's, temporary thing. It's going to take a little bit of manual work around. Okay. Um, now one of the big th problems with Haiku is hardware support. They gained a wireless interface so you can have wireless networking in Alpha 2. Yeah. However they had like two drivers it had almost nothing. What they then implemented was ability to support all of the BSD wireless drivers. Oh, interesting. So now if you've got drivers that work good under free BSD, they're going to work good under here. Now you might have to tweak them a little bit to get them working great, but it's going to it's going to work Well, that's great. good news. Uh, I was able to get it up and running on my little HP netbook, no problem. Full hardware acceleration, full USB support, uh, full wireless support. Really? All of it was great. Uh, the only problem is no WPA encryption for wireless networks oh. built in right now. They're working on that. It's in the mm. it's in the to do list. But if you, know, you need WEP or something else, it works just fine. Okay. So you can still get on on wireless networks. That still works great. It is open source and it is faster than hell. And yeah. I've been running it's this. Blast to use under virtual machine, uh, under virtual box, and on my little HP Mini sure, 1000 sure. for the last three days or so, because I wanted to see how well this is going to yeah. work. And how's it run on the Mini? Uh, it runs like a dream on the Mini. Yeah, it is the fastest thing oh, I've yeah. ever seen on I'm a gonna, netbook. I'm going to put it on my wind. I'm going to put it on my wind. Insanely fast. I bet I have, that'll work. Oh God! I have never. We lost our thing. A thing just fell. Yeah, here, I'll you, fix it. You keep well, going. I'll fix it. I've never seen a, a system run this fast on these netbooks. I just have never seen it. It is amazing. So what really, Chris is fixing a thing. Oh, there's a golden thing sitting in front of me. Man, you guys listening to the listen version of the show. <laughs> <Don't> listen for <laughs> you. You are missing out on hijinks today. In the yeah, studio. this is. But it's just, it's just phenomenal. They're, the problems, yeah. though. All right. No flash. That might be a problem for some people. The web browser that it comes with is called Web Positive. Yeah. It is a full, you know, base it is it is a full webkit based web browser. It is fast, it is beautiful, it is clean and it works great. However, not full support for all HTML5 video yet. So not all the full video codecs. Oh. So even if you go to YouTube, you're going to have some problems there. Oh, and I don't that have is my... that is coming. I was going to load up their web browser, but I don't have my network card on right now because I didn't hit the right one. You didn't do the right one. I didn't yet. set the right one. Um, so so that's one big problem. Honestly, though, not that big of an issue, really. Yeah. Not yeah. really. I think the Flash thing can be, you know, especially on a netbook, uh, it's just not the greatest experience anyways on a netbook. Right. So I think that can be forgiven a bit. Though, to be fair, uh, running it under Haiku would probably be the best experience possible because Haiku, yeah. Haiku is so damn fast. Yeah, And, and you and can handles literally go in and say, you know what, web positive, I want your flash thread to have 
all the system resources you can give it to or give none. it that extra or, juice. Or, or, can't, or, or, or dial it down it a bit. Down, yeah. So that's Clamp really that cool. down, B-Man. Uh, there are still not a lot of software applications for it. You're not going to get VMware. There's no virtual box for it yet. There are, I think, Box oh. boxes is out there. Actually, you I think get, I saw uh, somebody was working on a virtual box port. DOS sure. boxes there and working. QMU probably. Uh, QMU, I believe, yeah. is out there. So, so you've got options, but not the best options. If you're using this, you're really using it to run at this point Haiku specific software, or working on or hoping to get a lot of the KDE type software. That's I'm really sh- kind of how I'm looking. Do you know at if it, it has Java or if it has like one of the open source implementations of Java? Yeah, I, it's somewhere in there. Yeah. No, yeah. so that's Haiku. Link in the show notes, and we'll plus some link to the screenshots and things like that. The other nice thing is like a 235 megabyte ISO download. So you're so really great. you're not gonna you're not gonna break the uh, bandwidth cap there downloading this one. It's so it's so great. It's so great. It's so great. Now one of it the is other really things um, that I, I wanted, would like to point out. You things, go and talk for a second. One of the things that I thought people might get a little hater pants on me for is honestly, I've had. I've had some doubts about the netbook market to begin with, and now that I see what a great, fantastic, just without even trying operating system Haiku is on the netbook, I sincerely don't understand where Linux fits on the netbook anymore. Because, uh, and I, and I, I think that that's kind of been played out in the marketplace at this point, but honestly, it goes back to the comment I made in last week's episode where I felt like maybe Canonical chases the netbook too much. And if, if, you, can, if you can run an operating system like this that so natively, uh, or just so inherently, is better performing and, and a better candidate for a netbook, uh, where, where, where does Linux even fit anymore on, in this netbook space? And, uh, and I honestly think people need to try this and evaluate this and seriously ask themselves that. That's kind of what I'm looking at, too. I'm thinking, you know, this system's so fast. It's so lightweight. Honestly, this is far more lightweight than most of our mobile phone OSs. And it's more lightweight than most of the lightweight Linux desktops out there. Yet, it is extraordinarily powerful and easy to use and good looking. So, go, and exceptionally go, go, sophisticated. Go And willing to take risks and try interesting things. And look at this video for a second. All right. This is using a, a, a window decorator, which in Haiku is like a... a Kind of like part of your window theme sort of a deal. Okay. Something called stack and tile. Oh, now, okay. Now, go ahead and watch this for a second. All right. Now, this is this is haiku in action. For those, Sorry for those of you in the audio version. So, now, you hold down a key, and you can lock windows so together. So they just kind of snap together. So And then you can grab the tab, and boom. Notice what happened just there. He's tabbing applications he actually, together. Now, applications in haiku always have that little tab on the top. Yeah. They always look kind of like a tab. You hold down a key. You can lock windows together, move them in groups. I do like Bring that. Bring the tabs together. Boom. You now have multi-tabbed interface with two different applications. That is pretty sweet. Awesome. Now, this is doable in both KD4 and Compiz with some tweaking. Yeah. It doesn't really work all that great, but honestly, this is probably the best implementation I've ever used. It did look that. pretty simple. And it, it is pure awesome, and I heart love it. it a I lot. Heart it. I love it a lot. Honestly, I would say this. If... if uh, I don't think it could supplant. I don't think it could supplant Linux for all of the things I use Linux for. No, but in terms of my netbook, yep, Easy. I, I'm doing it. A heartbeat. It's, I'm it's making on the my, jump. It's on my HP Mini 1000 netbook right now. And Maybe it's not, not forever, away. but it's going to be there for quite a while. I'm not getting rid of mine. Yeah, it's just That's great. That's the thing. It's is great. I've put so many distros on that little netbook, and I've gotten rid of all of them at some pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. I don't really want to take it off. I don't want to get rid of this and throw something else on to play around with. I, hear you I want to leave it on this. What I really want is I want to see Haiku hit the full final release. I want to see it come out of alpha beta, yeah. and I want it to be a final release. Oh, man. For the most part, not because it's not polished. Because honestly, once you get the system set up, which is like literally like a five-minute install, and it's the easiest install in As the entire JB world. As wants us to point out, there is no Linux kernel. There's nothing in Linuxy about this. This no. is a this is a it's completely a, different operating system. It's a it's like a cousin, maybe. Think of this like a Friends of Linux episode, yeah. where, where we're talking about something that's a friend of Linux. And it, and it, and it's great. It would be a great source for for Linux developers. And, and UI developers and people interested in, in the netbook space to look at, to, to compare it against where Linux is at right now. And if you're looking at, like, what are the requirements to get it up and running, honestly, not much. And I mean, this setup is super simple, super, super easy. fast. Literally, this is the setup window. You go here, and you... It's got, uh, like, three buttons on it. You say, I want it to install into this drive. And, of course, you can partition it up and whatnot. And uh, begin. And then it goes on to... Uh, here's That's the, the setup manager. Yeah. This lets you partition it, which is great. And then I scroll down, scroll down, scroll <laughs> down, scroll <laughs> down. So then you select the drive. You select click the drive, start. Boom, install progress. Oh, look at that. A progress bar, and... 
gets done. done. And the and the fun and thing you can about keep it, installing it on more partitions if you want to. Well, or uh, external drives. Uh, right. So the the installer Easy. stays with the OS, and then you can plug something in, and you can run the installer from your desktop and just it's load just an OS. A little mini app, which is epic for setting so up cool. a backup recovery haiku install. So cool. And then you just copy the other files in there, and now you have a complete backup archive of your haiku desktop that you could boop from to recover your main one if something happened. It's a really great it's system. A, it's a great system. The, right. the thing right. I have a hard time with Haiku is purely its lack of software. That is the only issue I've got with it. It is a great system. I would, If you came to me right now and you renamed it to Linux and just said, this is Linux, and I saw it, and I'd never seen Linux or Haiku before, I would be like, holy crap, that is the best OS I've it's ever seen. It's the most seen. futuristic OS, but it's deceivingly simple. And it's... It's old. I mean, in a, in a lot of ways. And that's the ways. other thing that really trips me up and what also at the same time fascinates me about it. It's so... It, this was a big deal in the 90s. It's 2000 freaking 11. The, uh, this, they literally... I mean, sure, they've done some minor updates to it. Uh, like the icon format. The icon format in the old B operating system was very pixelated. Uh, yeah. Let's flip over to my screenshot real quick. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit so you can actually see those icons. So see these icons here? They, they don't look like anything terribly fancy. They're kind of isometric. And the old style they were very pixelated and that was the style that was like the style yeah. they were going for they replaced it with like a vector format it's a it's a custom vector it icon format still, though. that's a very lightweight vector icon format and it's very cool but so but otherwise oh, they haven't neat. really like they haven't really done anything that's like a new big futury thing it's just is old beyond yeah. but for some reason it's still the awesome. design is so good that it hasn't aged at all well it was based on some core principles it was that great were ideas. sound. Great ideas. And I, I, I can't recommend people try this out enough. Definitely. You, this is not going to run without hiccups on every piece of hardware out there. This does not have the yeah. driver support Fire beware. Linux has well, downloader beware. by any stretch of the imagination. But if you get a piece of hardware that it runs well on and you're willing to tweak it a little bit, That's maybe install a new BSD driver uh, to, to get it working, it's going to run fast. It's going to run smooth. It, for me, it's been stable well, as hell. I want to hear how it's working for people out there. I'd love to hear so Leave us a comment or yeah. go over to jupitercolony.com and let us know what you think. And also what you think about us covering the occasional cousin on the Linux Action Show. Not a regular thing, but on occasion. There are some great operating systems out there, and and one of my my favorite operating systems right now, and I will say unabashedly, is FreeDOS. Yeah, no, I think FreeDOS is awesome. Yeah, because it is a completely free DOS, and it's great for running like old DOS games, but you feel dirty installing MS DOS or oh, something. Oh yeah, yeah. And you plus, load FreeDOS, yeah. and it's so cool, and you can install uh, some great old chat rooms already loading up high environments on it. Look at that chat room, so awesome. And honestly, by the end, by the time we do the final outro for this show, some of them will already be up and running. They will. Like only installed on their netbooks it's, and it's everything. ridiculous fast it's so fast all right b man well that's our look at haiku it probably is and that brings us to the end of this week's amazing broadcast everyone who tuned in lucky good job everyone lucky ducks and the guys. people that are tuning in if you stay on the live stream it's the triumphant return of Jupiter at night. That's right. And we're doing it epic. Like, we're doing a Big full time. cast. B-Man's going to be there. Big. I'm there. It's going to be a four-man cast, John right? John and Jeremy. It's like Damn. cast a blast of mashed Damn. up with Jupiter at night. We're and relaunching it. Mega nerdy. And we're doing it tonight. So mega if you, nerdy. If you're downloading last, it's probably already out. So go to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Check it out. And grab that. You can't go wrong. Yeah, is there anything Hold else on. we want to cover? Because I'm on it. This guy right here. Right? Right? You can get more you know, Brian. A little more Brian. <laughs> you can't go wrong. Or, there's nothing else I want to go. Go to, you okay. know, there's a colony. Jupiter Colony. It's yeah, that's the a good place. If you seriously, if you played with Haiku, go on over there. Dude, I want to hear what you guys. We want to hear from you. And honestly, if you guys are involved in like the KDE project, and you have tried out Haiku, I want to hear what you guys think because I could see a lot of cool KDE apps coming to Haiku, yeah. and yeah. I want to see what you guys think of that. That would be so that would be really. Head neat. on over there. Twitter is cool. Facebook is cool. Links Whatever. In the show notes. End of the show. Done. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much. Done. For tuning into this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you next Sunday. Probably. Okay, be man. Be man. Be. Bum, 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 bum. More than meets the eye. Wait, now you're sitting up high. Autobots wage their battle to defeat the evil forces of. Oh. You hear style. You hear style.